Hello, I'm Marcia Cavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, all that has been going back and forth about local ferry service is the arguments about when the service will begin again. Meanwhile, the crossings are as quiet as the check-in desks at some hotels where room rates are an issue. We'll be looking at these stories tonight, as well as the police trail to two suspects in the Canal Street shooting incident. And after another violent weekend, a look at the year's big picture in crime. These stories, plus the sewage and water boards, planned improvements. And in sports, two teams going in different directions and the Heisman Trophy possibly heading to Baton Rouge. Heading our way are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, Jessica Williams, reporter, The Times-Picayune, The New Orleans Advocate, Kathy Finn, freelance journalist and business columnist for New Orleans Magazine, and Ramon Antonio Vargas, reporter, the Times-Picayune, the New Orleans Advocate. I'm going to go over to Jessica first, but quickly, something that sort of surfaced this afternoon is another cyber attack, this time New Orleans city government. This time New Orleans city government, um, we know very little details right now. What we do know is that uh, workers within City Hall, within the city council, were told to unplug their computers, shut them off because the city government was under a cyber attack. And it's interesting because the mayor, in conversations with her staff um, that we've been aware of, has stressed the importance of cybersecurity in the city was looking into several programs to beef up its cybersecurity. And so be curious to know um, what caused the attack, what they know about it, but we'll report more mm -hmm. details as we get them. So workers had to shut down their computers, et cetera. However, what about emergency communications and the NOPD? Are they still up and running, like 911? So what we know so far um, is that city workers were told to go home. Um, NOPD, there's a city system that affects multiple city agencies, such as NOPD. I have not had any other details about whether the 911 system is down. My understanding, and Ramon may know more. Yeah, the, the equipment, like the emergency response equipment and what the communications equipment that emergency uh, responders would use was not affected, is what we were told by the police department. Yeah, like right. the radio type equipment. Correct. And so that was not affected by the cyber attack. Okay, just basically everyday business over at City Hall. Now. Everyday business at City by... Hall. Uh, you know, all of the departments were told pretty much, look, shut your computer down while we work on the problem. And some of the folks even went home early um, because there was right. no way that they could work. Is there any indication this was a ransom? Uh, we do not know just at this know. point. We of course, this know. comes on really on the heels of what happened in the state government, right. which was mm -hmm. a ransom attack. Right. So. Hmm, okay, breaking story, so we'll be looking for more on that as the hours go by. I'm going to stick with you, Jessica, and something quite the opposite, something that's been going on for quite a while now. Two years. Ferry service yeah. and old boats not in use, new boats not in use. People on the West Bank really, really tired of it. Businesses being hurt. What, what's the latest on you this? You know, the RTA has been in a pickle um, really for two years with these two new ferries. Um, they inherited a system from the state uh, transportation of uh, the State Department of Transportation. Boats that were really, you know, decades old, um, in need of significant repair. And pretty much from the outset, when they inherited these boats in 2014, they said that they were going to replace them. They said it didn't make sense to continue to invest in boats that weren't going to, you know, were going to require much more costly maintenance and repair. They went out for a bid. They got a firm to come in and build new boats. However, those new boats had several problems that marine surveyors identified as, you know, issues that they would have to rectify before they would be able to put them into service. Um, some of those issues were corrosion that was found on the boats, uh, dissimilar metals that were placed together, which again can cause leaking and corrosion. Um, a separate issue, um, you know, the staff had to be trained in how to operate the new boats. And that's also been something that's held up them from being mm -hmm. on the water. The RTA, given the fact that it's a private contractor who was tasked with finding a boat builder uh, to fulfill this responsibility, really is seen widely as having dropped the ball, stripped that contractor of its responsibility. Which is and Transdev. This, which is Transdev Services. And then this uh, Monday actually hired a new firm, uh, Labmar Ferry Services, um, which is a conglomerate of several local firms, uh, one being a Laborde Marine, to operate the new ferry system. And that firm is expected to have a temporary ferry on the water as soon as, you know, within the next week or so. Because it's been two months where there has been no Canal Street ferry service, then the Chalmette ferry also went down. So there's been no ferry service at all on the river. There's been no ferry service at all on the river. 
however, as the older boats have repeated issues with their propulsion system, the hydraulic system, I believe, on the Chalmet Ferry is out right now, and they're working to repair it and have the Coast Guard to come in and clear the work that they've done so that they can get those boats on the water. But it's really seen as something that is just a function of how old these boats are. I mean, one of them is 77 years old. Mm -hmm. No, I remember times, especially as new bridges got built, that ferries seem really outmoded. <clears throat> Like a thing in the past, now we can't live without them. So, they're, so we're so we're seeing their value again, and they are really targeted from from downtown New Orleans to the uh, to the commercial center of Algiers, and so you can really well, they really you know, have become a hub for you know tourists. I right. mean, you have such a, a strong tourist population that rides the ferry, that sees it as picturesque, and that uses the ferries to get to the businesses in Algiers Point that really depend on that revenue. Um, you know, there's pizza shops there, there's gift shops, and, you know, bars and restaurants and places that otherwise, you know, tourists wouldn't get on the bridge to come to. And so a significant amount of their revenue is driven from that. And so they were the ones that were hit financially when these ferries have been out of service um, for the last two months. And Transdev, now, the former operator of the ferries <laughs> is going to offer a $100,000 grant to these businesses? They are. Transdev um, has offered to put up that grant. It's being uh, distributed in conjunction with the New Orleans Business Alliance. Applications for that grant went out, as I understand it, last Friday. Um, businesses who were affected uh, and can prove that they've had financial impacts from the ferries. You know, we've talked to one business owner that says she lost 90 percent of her revenue within the past two months, can apply for these grants. Um, you know, there's also a public relations campaign to try to drive more business and sales to the businesses that have been affected by this. But really, the main thing that people want to see is a boat back in the water, and we're hoping that we see that pretty soon. Because it really is more efficient for folks who live on the West Bank right. to get downtown, they say, than having to, you know, because buses are running right now, but it takes it uh, takes them longer. So. Exactly. The RCA does have a bus bridge, bus bridge in place, or uh, extra bus in place, but it isn't the same convenience right. as having, you know, being able to get on the ferry and get right off and walk to work. So maybe in about a week or so, we think there That's might be about run. Okay, doke. Thanks a lot, Jessica. Ramona, over to you. You know, right after Thanksgiving, there was this you know mass shooting on Canal <coughs> Street, happened at 3 a.m. right after the uh, Bayou Classic, um, and it really took several law enforcement agencies to track down the suspects. Yeah, and I mean that's a that's a product of uh, you know what the police say was. Um, describe as as two people who who kind of came to New Orleans uh, you know that weekend uh, it the case didn't really have anything to do with with the Bayou Classic but the reason that these folks are are in the city um, is is because of the Bayou Classic and just to take part in the festivities uh, walking across they've had some sort of dispute from before a few details have been available uh, have been made available exact about exactly what they were fighting over um, but uh, you know they they crossed paths among a crowd uh, and whatever they were fighting over was serious enough that they pulled handguns out and shot at each other um, in the end I think it was it was 12 people that were wounded, including one of the suspects, mm -hmm. um, a Le Bryson Polidor, who, uh, who, and this is all according to police, I need to just set this out front, um, uh, was hit in, in the left foot and then went to, to the hospital in, um, uh, in, in like I knew Iberia, and then I think told the emergency room staff, from from what we understand, told the emergency room staff that he um, that he had been shot somewhere in Generet, um, and uh, and that triggers the Generet City Marshal's office to to go out there and speak to this individual who claimed to have been shot in their jurisdiction. They didn't believe his story, but um, but didn't really quite know what was up. And then um, there was a. a Surveillance video of of the shooting and uh, in one of the frames you very clearly see a guy um, firing a gun and uh, the Generate City Marshal's office sees that's that's the guy that was here who had been shot mm -hmm. um, in in New Iberia uh, and and claimed to have been shot in Generate and so from there I mean they had his identity and uh, and it took a, but by that point. Um, enough time had passed that he had left the hospital and, and was no longer kind of in an easy reach and uh, and that's how they were able to identify Le Bryson Polidor. There was also another um, uh, another man named Stafford Starks who was the other main participant. He was not wounded um, though 11 other people beside Polidor were including a, uh, a Jonte Hebert who was a, uh, a successful college football player as well as high school player from Baton Rouge um, and uh, so, so we don't exactly know quite as much on, on that, but uh, but there's some sort of history there between the mm -hmm. two, and uh, very similar to another shooting where I think there were there were ten victims, but uh, that one was at least one fatality. Um, similar word involved, kind of a dispute from from people from out of town, from another part of Louisiana, who came to the city to kind of participate in sort of the outer the outskirts of 
of, of everything that Bayou Classic kind of entails, um, and uh, not really connected to the schools, but just in town to, to yeah. be a part of the scene, and, and the then festivities. and uh, it devolves into a fight that left a lot of people who who were not involved injured. Right. Two of the both of these suspects were from St. Mary Parish, right? Yes. Yeah, so they have ties to St. Mary Parish, and then the, you know the, that community is is close to to um, you know like Franklin and then Generette, right. I think is in Iberia, and they kind of front each other. So there's there's some spillover kind of, but it, it's really anchored in kind of those two those two areas. And according to the chief, that there was a substantial police presence there when this happened. Yeah, so there were like, I think they said at least seven or eight, and then, you know, we never really reported this in a story, but I know when I was kind of trying to do my early reporting, what stood out to me is that there were like a dozen illegal gun carrying arrests that they made. So they were out there looking, and that's part of their strategy to kind of try to prevent something like this from happening for events that bring a lot of people to that area of the city. Um, and it still happened, and so there were like seven officers there, and they're looking, and they're 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 taking um, you know guns from that that they uh, that they allege are being carried illegally, and um, and it still happened. So it, I, I think it just really drives home how difficult it can be sometimes when something's going to happen. It's going to happen. I wonder if they had any any police on horses there, because that always gives a real visibility of a. Well, I mean, the, I mean the, the shooting happened right next to like a police cruiser. Right. I mean, people like hid behind the police cruiser when it was happening. I, th I think they were visible. It's just. You know, when yeah. that, that, that cruiser was yeah. extremely visible. It was right there in the video. You could see it. But the police chief did emphasize investigation still ongoing. Yes, could be more suspects. I, I think you know, parsing their language is kind of a little mm -hmm. bit of reading tea leaves. Um, you know, it sounds like the the main participants uh, that they that they've kind of figured out who they believe the main participants are. Um, I think you may be looking at maybe some accessory after the fact okay. type things that they haven't quite ruled out, and possibly another shooter. One other thing, um, there was at least a third gun on the scene that we know that was one of the victims that they found. Um, it was and fired and then when I they didn't when I asked did, did that person try to, to pull out and mm -hmm. shoot as well um, and just wasn't able to and, and they didn't quite say no or mm -hmm. yes or just like it's still under investigation okay. so that's just three guns and in, in, in that little crowd right there so fortunately no one was killed in that but still yes. it's such a dangerous event okay thanks a lot Ramon Kathy over to you um, hotels we have a lot of hotel rooms so we're getting more <laughs> but still they're not making as much money as they were hoping to make per room. It is a little bit of a puzzle in uh, hotel analysts around the country. I, one in particular that I talked with um, from, for a column that I wrote for New Orleans Magazine is STR, which does a lot of uh, hotel research around the country and the world, in fact. Um, and one of the things they pointed out is in post-Katrina New Orleans, you know, once the, the hotels and tourism in general began to rebound, the hotels really came on strong. And uh, New Orleans has been seen as among the, the leading markets in the country in terms of both occupancy and, and room rate growth over, you know, within the past decade or so. Except um, it, one of the, the real puzzle now is that occupancy has stayed strong. It's somewhere around 75 percent, which is a very good number especially compared to a lot of other markets. Mm -hmm. So they've held up, despite adding rooms uh, to the, the inventory, but uh, room rates have not grown very much in the last several years, and, that, and that's a little bit of a puzzle. In fact, if you look at the rate from 2015, there's been, an, there's been up and down. They've gone, you know, up and down. But today's rate, the current rate, is somewhere like 84 cents above the 2015 rate, and that's not much growth. You know, the, the average rate is about $163 a night. That's for the whole area. Area. So, uh, you know, naturally, there are a lot of down, downtown hotels which are more expensive than that, but uh, they just haven't seen the growth. Uh, if you ask the hotel owners and managers what's going on, some of them point to the growth in the short-term rental market and say, well, that's taking—there's the, so many short-term rental rooms around the city, private, privately owned, that it's taking the air out of the rate structure. Um, th if you go and ask the, the short-term rental people and the association representing them, they say, well, why are the hotels complaining? They're still adding s rooms every year. I mean, we've had maybe a dozen hotels added over the past couple of years, two or three years, and there is an another dozen on the, on the drawing boards or underway now. And, and they're going to be larger ones than we've seen over the past few years. You know, you've got the Four Seasons coming on. Um, you've got potentially the Convention Center Hotel, which, you know, we don't know exactly what that's going to be yet, and some others. And just this week, a new hotel opened, the, uh, the Higgins Hotel. The Higgins Hotel at the, at the World, World War II Museum, II Museum yes. Uh, and, and even though they say that that's really targeting the, you know, guests who are going to the museum, I'm sure that you're going to see see them targeting uh, lots of other people as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a difficult market to raise your rates in. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's some sympathy among the, among 
uh, in the tourism market for the hotels, you know, they should be able to get higher rates. Well, a lot of people are not that sympathetic, but— um, yeah, There's something else that some of the hotel managers talk about. I guess it's a blessing and a curse, but is the website travel sites, like Travelocity, people who make the hotel— Discounters. Mm -hmm. that did. That's true. So. And, that, and that's a hard one to manage, I think, uh, as far as managing your rate in the face mm -hmm. of that kind of thing. But what the hotels would really love to see right now is the, a string of big events like they had in 2012, mm -hmm. 2013, when there was a Final Four, there was the BCS, the College Football Championship, and, and a Super Bowl, uh, among other things, along with all the other big annual events that you have. And, and we're, not, we're not seeing that. We haven't seen that since that period. Uh, fortunately, we do have a college football championship coming up, um, but it's, we don't have a Super Bowl until 2024. Mm -hmm. So, but and that's the one they really hunger for. You know? So they all will tell you, boy, what we wouldn't give for a Super Bowl coming up soon. But we have to wait on that. Yeah, but still, we are seeing more hotel rooms come on board, though. No in, question. In the future, no we're question. There's somewhere you know there are more than 41,000 rooms in the market now, and uh, and and as I said, the ones that are on tap to be opened over the next several years are larger than the ones we've seen over the recent years. So, And also on the other side, there's a lot of conversions into of smaller yes. office mm -hmm. buildings into boutique hotels. Right. Yeah, so that, there's lots of those. That continues, too, so. yes. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Thanks, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Eve, we're going to stick with you right now. Let's talk sports. Um, as you wrote, two teams going in opposite directions, and then also maybe a Heisman coming Yeah, down. yeah. Well, first of all, the two teams going in opposite directions, the Saints, obviously, they're, no matter what happens, they're in the playoffs, and so now they're just playing for for, uh, for seeding, but at the very end, we know that they're there because because they won the division, and so they're just trying to to, to play to get a bye that first week, and maybe they have the home field advantage throughout. Losing to San Francisco last week hurt a little bit because it it knocked them out of the first seed, but at least they're still there. The big disappointment has been the Pelicans, especially mm -hmm. with all the the hoopla that the that came earlier in the, uh, in the in the year. There have been some severe injuries, and and it just hasn't happened. The team last week uh, lost a game. It was the biggest loss total in franchise history. It was like 38 points. Was it to, to Dallas? Do you remember something like that? And so they're just having a, a hard time, but you just hope that it gels together at the, at the second part of the season. But, you know, like, like NBA, I mean, you really need to get attendance. You really need to be winning. Uh, and because there's so many games out there and so much stress on the, on the pocketbook, and so it's going to cause a real uh, – uh, major stress if the team doesn't just start doing better. But the other story is going to be the big story this weekend, particularly tomorrow, is the, the Heisman Award uh, uh, presentation. The Heisman is like the biggest name, in, uh, uh, certainly in, in college sports. It's uh, maybe not necessarily the biggest award, but it's a big name. And uh, Joe Burrow, the, uh, the the quarterback at LSU, is by all by all counts is is considered the heavy favorite to win. And so um, he went to you know what they do is they narrow it down to four people, and they all go to the New Orleans Athletic Club and they sit there and they and they announce one. And so probably tomorrow, if he does, he'll only be the second player from Louisiana, like like Billy Cannon won in 1959, and then and then uh, and then for him to win it. Um, there have been several. Well, I was looking at there through the years. There have been several people play for the Saints who, who were with other universities, but um, but who were Heisman winners. Uh, uh, Reggie Bush and Mark Ingram and Danny Werfel and Ricky Williams and some of the early Saints. And so we've had some uh, some Heisman winners in our presence. But it'll be a prestigious thing for LSU. Just you said New Orleans Athletic Club. I'm, I'm sorry, the New York okay. Athletic Club. Yeah, okay. Maybe they shifted yeah, it down yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. So. That would be nice to have it yeah. down here. All right. Well, good luck to Joe. We certainly <laughs> hope he walks away with it. All right. Thanks a lot, Eve. Okay. Move on over to you. I'm taking a look at our overall crime statistics. I mean, we just talked about, you know, mass shooting. That's a serious crime on, on Canal Street. What's this year been like, though, overall, in terms of crime for the city of so, New Orleans? You know, violent crime is, is definitely going to be uh, mixed results. Um, I mean, shooting uh, gun violence is, is always one of the top issues, uh, if not the top issue, you know, public safety-wise. Um, you know, homicides last year was a, a record low, and they're going to improve, uh, but barring a, a calamity, um, they are going to—the uh, the city is going to come in even lower than that. Um, and and yeah, I think that's a testament to a lot of the a lot of the hard work that the city has done. Mm -hmm. To I mean, that was a goal that they set out several years ago, right. and uh, and and certainly that's that's a testament to 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 that work and, and a lot of the grassroots stuff that um, that kind of accompanies an effort like that. But uh, less encouraging is going to be that shootings are are pretty much going to hold steady. Um, 
uh, or, or are holding steady at this at this point. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a significantly <coughs> less gun violence going on. It's just, uh, and it, it's hard to know kind of what influences the number, uh, exactly what influences the number of murders in, in any given year. Um, there's certainly an element of, uh, of, of, of luck, even when you speak to the people, you know, that know, uh, that know the most about that. Um, and a lot of these numbers, I, I need a credit, are going to be to, um, to Jeff Asher, the local crime analyst mm -hmm. who, who tweets about this quite a bit. Um, so, it, it, yeah, and, uh, and moving away from that, I mean, uh, another thing that's on residents' mind is just uh, car uh, car break-ins and, and car thefts are, um, and car burglaries specifically are, are insanely high, um, are, are much, much higher um, from last year. And uh, and it, it's just been kind of holding steady, steadily increasing, um, you know, throughout the year. And so I think uh, when you look at it, it'll, it'll be, I mean, certainly the it, good news on the on the number of homicides being being lower than even last year when it was uh, when it was a record low. But, um, but personal property crimes, uh, definitely yes. an increase in there. And like you know, you know, uh, car burglaries, car break-ins. I mean, Lakeview has just really been plagued by that. Yes, and I, you know, I think there's there's probably some socioeconomic factors going over there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people, a lot of people that live there kind of do well, and um, and there, are, I mean, certainly kind of some some cars that you you might call desirable um, if you're if that's kind of what you're into, uh, stealing cars or trying to break into them, right. um, and uh, and certainly when you talk to them. I think uh, it's it's of little consolation to, to them mm -hmm. that maybe you know homicide the, the number of homicides is lower <coughs> than it was last year, um, but you know police say that they're they're trying to address kind of kind of all of it. I also believe that there are factors that kind of go beyond uh, beyond what the police department alone can do. Um, you know that 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 factor into that and um, yeah. yeah. I think when you know, the, the, the other thing that's different is that. When, when there are crimes, even small crimes, we hear about it all day long, mm -hmm. like with beeps on our iPhone and all that, sure. and, then, and then the newspaper and television. It used to be like for the, the minor crimes, once a week there'd be like a police report in the newspaper yeah. that listed here, and now when something happens, and sometimes the same crime you may hear like two or three times, and so there's just so much report. And so whenever I hear that crime is down, I say, what? How can crime be down? I mean, right. uh, I mean, it, it sounds like the streets are going mad, but I, I think that's part of it, too, that there's just so, so much well, attention, so much information. And we certainly live in a community where there's there's headline grabbing crimes pretty pretty consistently. I know we've tried to kind of limit um, limit how much we kind of do uh, you know on the and and just do one roundup of kind of like briefs. Uh, no, you're only doing like right. That. I mean, right. this is something people need to but, know. Yeah, then, uh, yeah. I, I don't like criticize that. No, no, right. and I'm, yeah, but it's just I'm hard to get that. used to. Well, sure. as, as you pointed out, I mean, there's real concern about juvenile crimes, mm -hmm. and particularly with auto break-ins. But it is really interesting to see that stat for the shootings just sort of remain the same as mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. That. But, violent it, crime. It, but last year also was a, was a significant drop from the prior year on that statistic. It just kind of held steady, uh, which indicates to you that you know, it's just that it's not significant less violence than last year, but certainly if you open that time frame to two years, um, then, then certainly the picture looks a little more okay. concerning now than it did in 2017. Okay. Let me get you to touch on right now, there was an indictment regarding this clergy abuse. Yes, uh, George Brignac, the uh, a deacon who has been charged uh, three pr prior, uh, I'm sorry, has been has been arrested three prior times and charged one, one previous time uh, with child molestation, has been uh, has been indicted, uh, was indicted on, on Thursday. Uh, on account of first degree rape, that is a mandatory life sentence if he is convicted. Um, he he beat the first three cases, and uh, and we'll see what happens now. But the but the process, uh, Orleans Parish District Attorney Leon Kinnazar's office said that there's a lot of witnesses and very compelling evidence in this case, and um, they've pledged to publicly to, to push forward with it. Um, it is significant because it's the first clergyman on the list that Archbishop uh, Gregory Amon released last year of credibly accused, who uh, who is being criminally prosecuted. Okay, all right, thanks, Ramon. We're going to wrap up with you, Jessica. Sewage and Water Board. What do they have on tap? I mean, they certainly have a long to-do list. What do they do? Um, you know, as, as you remember, the uh, mayor and the legislature reached a deal this uh, year in the legislature called the Fair Share Deal, uh, would allow the city uh, sewage and water board to get $50 million in a one-time payment, and primarily that one-time money is going to be used to pay back contractors who did a lot of the emergency work after the August uh, 7th flooding uh, event, the deluge a couple years ago. Um, but $26 in reoccurring money, um, as was approved uh, in large part 
part by voters uh, who back the tax on short-term rentals. Right. Yeah. Um, and that money is going to be used on staff equipment to clean catch basins, is my understanding, to fill potholes. Um, they're going to also upgrade uh, their power system to run on a more newer uh, power standards supplied by Energy New Orleans. Uh, the turbine that needs a blankie is going to get a blankie. Mm -hmm. It's going to get an opportunity to be uh, running and operating in cold weather. Um, and this was really... Uh, <laughs> really, this really came to light as a result of last November's Boar Water Advisory. Mm -hmm. And the, the question was, well, we have these two new water hammers online, and why do we still have a Boar Water Advisory? Well, it's because the turbine couldn't operate because it was below 45 degrees outside. And so that's going to be outfitted so that it can run in cold weather. Um, altogether, it'll cost about $3 million to outfit that turbine. Then we'll have another $3 million for a more reliable connection between uh, energy and the sewage and water board. Uh, and that will be enough, that will produce enough megawatts to replace two of the other turbines that the Sewage and Water Board currently has mm -hmm. and allow those turbines to be supplied with newer, uh, modern 60-cycle power. All right. Um, I mean, there, there's just so much that has to be done and billions of dollars of improvements. So basically what you just outlined is going to be happening in 2020. That's really what we can, can That's what we can look, look forward, forward to. to. That spending plan is going to start to be rolled out this summer. There's going to be a public uh, information campaign that's going to come out so citizens know exactly when the money is going to be spent, exactly when they can start seeing some improvements. And this is really just a drop in the bucket. I mean, there's also, you know, a ton of FEMA money that the agency and the Department of Public Works are splitting. Uh, to about $2 billion to repair cracked uh, pipes and uh, crumbling streets. Mm -hmm. And even that $2 billion is a drop in the bucket when compared to the estimated $9 billion that they need in order to fully repair all the potholes a in the city. A lot of repairs, because, I mean, just we've seen water mains breaking and streets flooding lately, too, so just a lot of things going on. All right, it's time to wrap up. Looking ahead. Well, talking about football, next week is the New Orleans Bowl. And the uh, the two teams, there's one is Appalachian State, known as the Mountaineers, so we'll have Mountaineers in town. And the other is the University of Alabama, Birmingham, which interestingly is a school that a few years ago gave up football. And people said, no, we want our football back. And so they got it. Now they're in a, uh, now they're in a bowl game, and maybe they can... Uh, Fill some hotel rooms. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jessica. Jessica. Uh, in 2020, we're going to have electric bikes in New Orleans. Um, the blue bikes that are on display now that are now pedal, uh, push pedal, they mm -hmm. will be pedal assists, where you can go a little bit faster when you get on your blue bike. But you don't have to make an electric bike. You can still do... You can still the, do the pedal bike. Just, just pedal. turn it off, and you can still pedal the same way that you always have. Have those been used a lot, those blue bikes? Uh, they've been they've used been pretty regularly, uh, and the usage has gone up every year that they've okay. been in operation. All right. Thanks. Kathy. Well, back to football again, since you, d you mentioned it. Uh, the college football championship is coming up mid-January. The hotel, you should be happy about that. Normally, if you have a local team in, in a big game like that, you know, the hotels would rather not have that mm -hmm. because they think they won't fill up their rooms. But, if this, LSU, is, yeah. but if this is LSU, <laughs> I think that those hotels will be just fine. And we want it to be LSU. Yes. Thanks, Kathy. Ramon. And uh, not a good football news story. Uh, Joe Horn, the former mm -hmm. Saints uh, player implicated in an alleged uh, scheme to defraud a, uh, a health care program for retired NFL players. Um, all indications are that he is uh, cooperating, so we'll see how he factors into the case that also involves nine other players. Ah, that's sad news. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys, for being here. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening.